Thank you, Dr. Reese. <laughs> President Zhao, uh, it is uh, an honor uh, to be here with you this morning as we begin a day considering these added years that we have been granted. Um, one thing is very clear. We are living in an era that where people are living longer uh, than our grandparents, our great-grandparents ever could have dreamed. And let me say that members of the National Academies, uh, you, this elite body, um, are um, special in many ways. Uh, reasoning from the research literature, I can also tell you uh, that the vast majority of you are going to live to very advanced ages. <laughs> Uh, you're going to sail past 80, see your 90s, and lots of you are going to live to be 100. And your children, your grandchildren? Well, one prominent demographer in Germany recently estimated that about half of the babies born since 2000 will live to 100 and beyond. In the 20th century, life expectancy in industrialized nations around the world nearly doubled. And, and I know you know these statistics, but make no mistake, um, this is a change that is unprecedented in the history of humankind. More years were added to average life expectancy in the last century than all of the increases across all prior millennia of human evolution combined. So in historical terms, in a blink of an eye, we nearly double the length of the lives that we are living. We don't know for sure what life expectancy was as our ancestors were evolving in the African savanna, but the estimates range from 18 to 20. <laughs> Life was short. Um, you know, think about it for a minute. It was, you know, you have to um, grow old enough to be able to reproduce and then hang around long enough for your offspring to be able to grow old enough to reproduce. So it was touch and go for the species throughout much of, of, of our history. Evolution acted on age, especially in these early years. It acted in the way that evolution acts at a snail-like pace and life expectancy got a little bit longer, a little bit longer, a little bit longer. By the mid-1800s, life expectancy in the U.S. had reached the mid-30s. By 1900, it was 47. And then by the end of that same century, life expectancy was 77. Today, it's 79, and this change is not finished with us Yet, in recent years, three months has been added to average life expectancy at 65 every year. And because fertility rates dropped by half across the very same years that life expectancy increased so dramatically, we have now aging societies. We could have just had a larger population of long-lived people had we not also seen this decline in fertility. But now we see age redistributed in societies in, in very important and dramatic ways. In 1900, about 4% of the population in the United States was over 65. Today it's 14%. And by 2030, it will go to, to 20%. And we are the young kid on the block compared to our friends in, in Western Europe and parts of Asia where this proportional change um, is much greater. Uh, today, 23% of the population in Japan is over 65. And projections range from 35 to 40% for 2050. These are stunning changes 
in the population. Well, so far, um, the reigning champ of longevity is a woman named Jean-Louis Calma, a French woman. She holds the title of the longest lived person ever. Uh, she died in 1997 at the age of 122. And so we know that lifespan capacity has to be at least 122. Uh, she's already made it. And I like to tell stories about her whenever I get a chance because she was a wonderful character. Uh, she'd met Van Gogh when she was a teenager, and so she played herself in the movie Vincent and Me uh, make, at the age of 114, which made her the oldest actress of all time. Uh, she was known for her sharp wit uh, to the end. Uh, a journalist interviewed her when she was 120 and asked her what sort of a future she envisioned. Kalma paused and said, uh, a very short one. <laughs> <laughs> but my favorite story about Kalma, hands down, is one about a property deal that she made at the ripe old age of 90. Uh, she lived in her own home, the family home, in the French city of Arles. And she had every intention of living there for the, her entire life until she died. But there was this young lawyer, this 47-year-old lawyer, and he really wanted to buy the house. Uh, so he would make her an offer, and uh, she would say no, and he would go away, and then he'd come back later and make her a better offer, and this went on for some time. Uh, at one point, he appears on her doorstep and he says, I have a proposition for you. I will pay you $400 a month for the rest of your life if you will deed the house to me on your death. So she thinks about it, and she says, OK. And a contract is drawn up, and over the next 30 years, <laughs> he pays her more than three times the value of her home. In the end, uh, she outlived him by two years. <laughs> he, he died at 77, uh, but they had become friends over the years, and he attended her 120th birthday party shortly before he died. Um, <laughs> and they were overheard talking, and word has it that she had turned to him at one point and said, look, we all make bad deals. <laughs> That's what 122 can look like. Well, how long can we live? What is lifespan capacity? Uh, the answer to this question is unknown. Uh, and the topic is the subject of considerable debate. You know, ever since we humans uh, understood our own mortality, we have been searching for a fountain of youth. We, we used to sail off in ships. Uh, now we turn to laboratories, uh, and today you will hear from some very serious scientists who believe that scientific advances in the 21st century may lead to an increase in lifespan, the capacity of life. But what we also know is that increasing lifespan capacity had nothing to do with the increases in life expectancy that we are living through today. To our knowledge, we are hardly different from genetically from our ancestors 10,000 years ago. Rather, the story of how we, as a society, somehow launched ourselves into this era of long life um, doesn't really begin with a discussion about older people. It begins with a story about babies. The dramatic increase in life expectancy, the average length of life, came about largely because fewer of the youngsters died. In 1900, 25% of babies born in the United States died before they reached five. 
many more died before they reached 12. Maternal mortality was very high, and in fact, death was not associated strongly with age because people would become sick and die at all ages. So life expectancy in the last century increased a great, greatly from saving the lives of the little ones. Well, how did this happen? Um, in, a, in a word, uh, culture, and by culture I don't mean only the languages we speak and the foods that we eat, but the crucible that holds science and technology and broad scale social norms and behavioral practices. We built a world to protect the young. We, I should say, you discovered the causes of many diseases and the ways that they were spread. We developed public health programs to inoculate young ones against diseases they would never have to suffer. We didn't stop there. We pasteurized milk and purified waterways. We implemented the systematic collection of waste garbage collection, <laughs> and there are historians who write that you have your garbage collectors to thank as much as your physicians for this increase in life expectancy. Um, scientists discovered the nutritional needs of young children, and in a matter of decades, about 20 years, food fortification programs in the United States and Europe built vitamins into the food supply that virtually eliminated conditions like rickets and other nutritional disorders. We didn't stop there. As fertility rates fell dramatically, we came as a society to invest more in children and put public education in place in every state in this great nation so that all children, not just the privileged few, could learn how to read and write. Agricultural technologies led to a steady food supply throughout the year. The discovery of electricity meant that not only electricity but refrigeration was made available in virtually every American household and imagine how the safety of the food supply improved with refrigeration in the entire population. In other words, we built a world exquisitely designed to support young life. Today it's not just from birth. Um, we begin to care for young ones before they're even born. Think prenatal vitamins and care. Think Mozart played at belly height. <laughs> and now this population pyramid that we learned about in school is being transformed into a rectangle. And if you're the kind of person who can get chills from biostatistics, <laughs> my people. <laughs> These are the ones that should do it because what this means is that for the first time in history, the vast majority of babies born in the developed world are having the opportunity to grow old. This is a stunning achievement. And so here we are. Standing at a point in history where for the first time people in the Western world can anticipate living to old age and where we will see four, five, and conceivably six generations alive at the same time. You know, we often hear people say back in the old days all the generations lived together on the family farm. Uh, not really, <laughs> occasionally, um, but mortality prevented that. A 20-year-old male today has a better chance of having a living grandmother than a 20-year-old in 1900 had of having a living mother 
That's what these changes have done. And this is a game changer. It will change every aspect of life as we know it. Work, retirement, the nature of family, education, politics, all of these aspects, these fundamental aspects of life will change. I've had the privilege of, of serving in a MacArthur network on aging societies for in, in the past recent years. It's led by Jack Rowe, um, and we have been considering how aging societies can be high-quality societies, and perhaps, again, how aging societies could improve even more the welfare of young children. Uh, you will hear more from him this afternoon. But interestingly, even though we've been given this gift of life, uh, 30 extra years, where you think we might be out dancing in the streets, you know, cheering on, yay, we're going to live for a long time, we're not seeing that at all. Policymakers are concerned about the sustainability of policies, and individuals are concerned about their un own futures. Why? Well, I don't have a lot of time with you today, and so I thought I would summarize the research literature in one slide. <laughs> <laughs> You can, you can put anything you like on the y-axis. Um, uh, this has been the premise, I think, of most research on aging. Um, <laughs> and I would like to tell you that there's really no support <laughs> for, for the, this model. Um, but in fact, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of evidence that uh, uh, many, for, for many problems that occur uh, with age. At the same time, the more we learn about aging, the more nuanced that story becomes. It is clear at this point that a steady downward trajectory does not characterize aging necessarily. And in fact, um, there's a lot of good news. Um, every generation over the last 50 years, every ge co birth cohort that has arrived at old age has been healthier than the one before it. And Today, there is some evidence that this progress may have paused and may even uh, reverse, but there is no question that the elderly today are functioning better than the elderly 50 years ago. By and large, older people today are emotionally stable, knowledgeable, and among the educated are faring very well. So let me show you some findings uh, that are quite reassuring. Um, this is a slide uh, produced by my colleague John Chauvin at Stanford, an economist. Um, and what you're seeing here uh, is not age on the x-axis, uh, but historical time. And what you're seeing um, in these lines is the age where mortality risk reaches uh, different levels. So in black, you see mortality, the age where mortality risk gets to 1%, 2%, 4%. What Chauvin argues is that when your mortality risk reaches 2%, that is, in the next year you have a 2% chance of dying, we'll call you old. And what he says is that we've been measuring age wrong because we've been measuring it as the number of years since you were born, and a better way to think about it may be the number of years you have left. And you know how people like to say 60 is the new 40? <laughs> well, 65 really is the new 59 by this measure. <laughs> so if we, if we look at 1970, this is for men, but women's um, uh, uh, trajectories are, are highly similar. Uh, a man reached that mortality risk point at 59. In 2000, that was 65. Now, Jim Vopel, a uh, demographer, uh, says that in 2014, these findings are even more striking, that 70 is the new 60. So what we're seeing is this indication of impairment of uh, illness being pushed out farther into the future. 
demographers were very nervous early on when they saw just how big this change was, that what we would done was to create longer and longer periods of disability. And instead, it looks like we haven't reduced those periods of disability very well, but we have pushed them out into the future. So the added years of life expectancy in adulthood are largely healthy ones. Arguably, even more important is functional health. And these are findings uh, from uh, a recent study published in the Journal of Gerontology. This is self-reported functional health, asking people at different ages whether they are healthy enough to do housework, whether they are healthy enough to work. And what you see is that the majority of people, even in the 85 plus age group, report that they are functionally healthy enough to work. Now, what you also see in this study and uh, in, in the, the literature at large is that what does change is the variability that we see in functioning in, uh, at, at increasingly older age groups. And this variability in functioning is not random. Um, what you see here are the proportion of people with no functional limitations at different ages. This is a study published by Jim House. And at 30, regardless of education level, so in red you're seeing people with uh, college education, uh, little education in blue, and, and less than a high school education in green, at 30, they're functionally healthy, regardless of education. And if we go to the very end of life, people over 85, we begin to see functional health converge again. Um, this very likely reflects mortality and illness just prior to the end of life. But in the middle, we see dramatic differences by education level. Um, and we don't fully understand what education does but it clearly predicts um, uh, optimal aging. The story about cognition is not quite so cheery, but we're also learning more about that. This is what we have seen in study after study, longitudinal data, cross-sectional data, that processing speed, uh, the ability to take in new information and act on it, declines gradually across adulthood. What we hear less about, however, is that across the same years, knowledge is increasing. So people know more, even if they're not as quick in generating responses to brand new, novel information. And this estimate of knowledge really has to be grossly underestimated because the tests of knowledge are general knowledge. You know, what is the capital of Afghanistan? It's not. They're not questions about deep expertise, which also seems to improve. And there have been two new studies published recently, uh, supported by the National Institute on Aging, um, that to me may be really turning on its head this idea that we see gradual decline in cognitive processing with age. Um, this is a, a slide from an article published by David Bennett and his group. And they followed people over time, a large group of older people over a decade. And what they find is that some of the people they were following go on to develop Alzheimer's disease. Others never do. And what you see in the blue line is the cognitive functioning over that 10-year period of people who were in prodromal stages of Alzheimer's disease. They were going to go on and develop it. To me, the really exciting part of this is when you look at the cognitive decline in those people who did not develop Alzheimer's disease. And if there's any good news about Alzheimer's disease, and there is not much, um, it's that most people won't get it. And so I think this also is telling us, as are these other studies, that a, a, a reliance on statistical means as the primary way to describe a, uh, aging and, and to uh, 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 think about what it means may be conflating illness 
with aging. And the story about emotion, emotional experience, and stability is really good. <laughs> if it surprises you, you're not alone. It makes headlines. Um, but older people report better emotional experience in day-to-day -day life. They're better able to regulate strong emotions, um, better able to solve emotionally charged problems, um, and slower to anger, more likely to forgive, more appreciative, more grateful about life. We must not fail to tap a growing resource, maybe the only natural resource in the world that's actually growing, older people, who are knowledgeable, healthy, em emotionally stable, and even-handed. We need to build an infrastructure that taps older citizens. Of course, it's hardly time to rest on our laurels. There are a raft of diseases, not new, but new in terms of their impact on society that are associated with aging, and we need now to invest in finding cures and finding ways to prevent them from developing. We need a cure for Alzheimer's disease. We need to find ways to prevent osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, stroke, cardiovascular disease. Age is a risk factor for most diseases. And in a society that is aging, we need to find ways to address them. Human need, you say, is the basis for virtually all of science. Science helped get us here, and we need science today more than we ever have uh, so that we can move forward with new advances that keep the population healthy. And today, maybe the best news of all is that the potential of science is breathtaking. Um, biologists are finding ways to rejuvenate stem cells. Uh, this is a uh, uh, and a, there's an approach called parabiosis. Uh, my colleague Tom Rando uh, at Stanford has been working in this area with muscle tissue. And for many years, people believed that um, uh, muscle tissue could not repair because as well as in younger uh, um, species, uh, or I'm sorry, young, younger organisms because of some deficiency in the stem cell itself. With parabiosis attaching the blood supply of a young animal to an old animal, um, Tom and his colleagues have shown that the stem cell activity, this is what you're seeing um, uh, in young and old animals, and then, whoops, sorry, um, after uh, attaching this blood of the old animal to the young, we see this rejuvenation of stem cell activity and muscle repair. Um, this has been shown now in, in, in liver and in brain and heart tissue. Um, you'll hear more from the biologist shortly. Um, but these kinds of findings on the biology of aging suggesting that there may be ways to improve health and to keep us healthy over time are remarkable. Technologies will come to help us uh, function despite problems, and we are seeing um, many new technologies emerge. Um, there are sensor technologies that can be placed in homes that maintain uh, privacy, just a few sensors in a home, that can monitor activity and let loved ones or other individuals know if there is a change in activity. A colleague of mine, Tom Andriaki, has developed a shoe that slows the progression of osteoarthritis. Wearable devices like this um, will be coming on the market. And bioskin, these very, very thin um, 
uh, sensors that will be wearable and wireless, wirelessly uh, allow for the monitoring of different kinds of health conditions. And in some cases also the treatment of those conditions is being developed um, and is very exciting. Um, these bioskins will be 10 times thinner than saran wrap, that kitchen wrap that we'll wear or have tattooed on us that can monitor health states. We're beginning to make a little bit of progress uh, with obesity. Uh, just as we need to turn to the laboratory and support research on basic cures and biology, we need to find ways to change the way we live. In long-lived populations, solving problems will mean changing behavior. Today, more than a third of adults and 17% of youth are obese, and we must turn this around. We're beginning to make progress on understanding the nutritional needs of young children, um, and we need to find out more about this, about individualized medicine, but also individualized nutritional needs so that we understand what kinds of diets are best for people at different ages um, and be able to help counsel people on ways that diet must change. When we think about health in an era of longevity, it will not be about older people alone. We need to get younger people um, engaged in activities and exercise with habits that begin early in life and continue all the way through. High impact exercise, especially in girls, may help to prevent osteoporosis. And we have to develop new norms so that these exercise practices never stop. Um, exercise today may be the best preventive practice around, including uh, competing with other kinds of medications. Um, it, geriatricians, I know, say that if we could put exercise in pill form, it would be the most sought after drug on the market. We're learning that behavior influences health in other ways. Engaging in emotionally meaningful contributions to society appears to have as big health consequences, benefits, as smoking cessation. If Linda Freed has her way, public health recommendations in the future will be get a flu shot and go volunteer. And as research accumulates, it also appears that work, paid or unpaid, may improve cognitive functioning. We have known for a long time that people in the workforce are better physically and cognitively than people who are out of the workforce, but selection effects have prevented a deep understanding of this. Um, in a comparison of countries by the generosity of the pension programs, uh, Bob Willis and Roe Etter have shown that cognitive functioning in a population um, in countries where pension policies are less generous <laughs> perform better cognitively than in countries, I won't say anything here, but in countries <laughs> where people retire early. You already saw a slide of this book from Dr. Zhao. Um, in an age where people are coming to live out their full lives, it is time, it is essential, that we come to terms with death. You know, medicine was born in an era where the vast majority of people died prematurely. Today, aggressive medical treatment at the end of life tops the list of the greatest fears of older people. My colleague Phil Pizzo and former Comptroller General David Walker chaired this report and already, as you've heard, this is having a, a big effect on uh, policies and programs and approaches. And member uh, Tul Gawanda's book, uh, Being Mortal, um, has done just a tremendous service for the nation. 
Um, writing a book on dying and making the New York Times bestseller list is really an accomplishment. Uh, but he has so beautifully uh, crafted uh, the situation and, and the arguments uh, that people are beginning to engage in these conversations. We have the opportunity to live long and to die well. More and more, we see that this is, is possible. And indeed, in the end, um, the problem may not be aging at all. Uh, the problem may have much more to do with inequality. Um, I mentioned the MacArthur Network on Aging Societies, another network chaired by Nancy Adler on inequality came to similar conclusions. Both of these networks, one on socioeconomic status, one on longevity, concluded that the cumulative effects of disadvantage on health present a challenge that we must address. To fully reach the potential that longevity affords, we must acquire a deep understanding of disadvantage and we must develop bold, lifelong interventions and investments in the entire population. Disadvantage has effects early in life on children. You see here the prevalence of health problems by socioeconomic status um, from asthma, ear disease, injury, physical inactivity. We're seeing this very early in life. And socioeconomic status education puts people on tracks where they enter workplaces, where they don't have health insurance, there's shift work, long working hours, family conflicts, low job control, job insecurity, and by some accounts, this may account for about 20 to 40 percent um, of the differences in life expectancy. Here, you see that it's not just quality of life that is affected uh, by disadvantage. The very length of life is predicted by family income. The greatest threat to failure in realizing the potential of aging societies is setting the bar too low. It will be assuming that aging is synonymous with decline. It will be a failure to recognize that pediatrics is as important as geriatrics in long-lived societies. It will be a failure to make physical exercise something that begins early and lasts all the way through. It will be a failure to tap the resource that older people represent. It will be a failure to recognize that a growing population of even-handed, emotionally stable people can address some of the greatest problems in the world today. We can make aging societies the best thing that ever happened to children and families. Longevity is giving us the opportunity for the first time ever to fully redesign life so that added years of life can improve quality of life at all ages. Uh, we must not waste this gift of long life. Thank you.